Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the 2023 UCSF Academic Senate Town Hall on Sustainability entitled From Carbon Neutrality to Decarbonization, UCSF Opportunities. We are so glad you're here to, with us today to learn about sustainability activities here on campus and in the Medical Center. I think today's town hall will give everyone a sense of hope and agency to address the single biggest health threat facing the globe, namely climate change. I'd like to thank Stephen Chung, chair of the UCSF Academic Senate for giving us the opportunity to hold this town hall, as well as Aaron Gore and other senior leaders for their roles in moving us forward. First, I'd like to introduce Chelsea Landolin, assistant professor of community health systems and former sustainability committee chair. Chelsea. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Uh, to help kick us off, um, I would like to uh, share a video with you um, that we made to help uh, help express uh, uh, help express where we where we stand with climate and uh, the directions that we suggest uh, that we go um, as a campus. Take it away uh, with the video. If we're not saying to ourselves, I can't believe we just did this. I can't believe we're making this change. We're really doing things differently now. Then we're not doing enough for climate change. UCSF emitted nearly 100,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide from 2012 to 2019. The healthcare sector in the US is responsible for 10% of our national carbon emissions every year. If the healthcare sector was a country, it would be the ninth largest emitting country in the world and emissions continue to climb. We are at 1.0 Celsius above pre-industrial levels now. At the current rate, we will reach 1.5 Celsius in eight to 12 years. At 1.5 Celsius, we will see an increase in severe weather, drought, food shortages and famine, disease vectors and spread of tropical diseases to the north and south, negative health outcomes for humans like infectious disease, pulmonary disease from airborne pollutants, and deaths from drought, storm injuries, heat stroke, and fires, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and melting polar ice, damaged ecosystems, some irreversible and unforeseeable impacts. And even though the poorest regions of the world cause the fewest emissions, models project that they will bear the greatest costs, a terrible inequity that we must prevent. Changing the infrastructure of producing emissions doesn't happen overnight, but it must happen fast. The time to kick the can down the road is over. Now is the time to look hard at what we're doing and rapidly plan and implement dramatic cuts to emissions. These emissions come from many places. There are power plants on our campus that use fossil fuels. For instance, the Parnassus Central Plant emits close to 50% of all UCSF's carbon emissions. There are anesthesia gases, refrigerants, and the amount of plastic used in our hospitals and clinic, which is made with petroleum and emits greenhouse gases when it degrades. The jet fuel burned during travel to conferences and meetings, and the gasoline burned when employees, students, and even our patients used to commute to hospitals and clinics. The meat of animals like beef and lamb in our cafeterias and restaurants. We learned a lot in the past few years about how quickly we can change. Change is possible, change is necessary, and change needs to happen now. Excellence in healthcare is no longer just about achieving incredible health outcomes. UCSF is already great at clinical care. Excellence today means taking control of our impact on the planet and holding ourselves accountable as an organization. UCSF's health mission makes us acutely aware of our institutional environmental impact. Over the past 10 years, we have focused on increased energy efficiency. Now UCSF is committed to eliminating fossil fuel use and in helping the University of California system and the state of California reach our collective environmental goals. We have made great strides in the last few years towards decarbonization. We have reduced our use of high emission anesthesia gases. We are transitioning to low emission refrigerants and we're starting the switch to electric vehicles. 
Our new UCSF Bayfront Medical Building and Illinois Street Parking Garage will be fully electric, and we are planning more all-electric buildings such as the new hospital at Parnassus Heights and the Parnassus Research and Academic Building. We are proud of what we have accomplished, and we know there is more to do. UCSF will continue to address our energy reduction projects, LED lighting, building controls, and other energy efficient measures such as electric heating and cooling. What is different now is that we will be moving to the next stage of our strategy. We are spending the next year studying the overall UCSF electrification plan, including the future of utilities at Mission Bay, UCSF Fresno, BCH Oakland, as well as a deep dive into the removal of fossil fuels from our current Parnassus power plant. We will share the results of these studies with you. There is no one solution to the problem, and it will take each person and all of UCSF working together to drive change. We live in one of the richest cities, in one of the richest states, in one of the richest countries in the world. Do we think it's fair to pay others to cut their emissions so that we can keep polluting? Are we living up to our values as health professionals and as an institution? Buying carbon offsets while continuing to pollute is the reality of so-called carbon neutrality. I would argue that zero carbon, that is producing no carbon emissions, is what allows us to live up to our values. According to a Pew Research Center survey, 60% of Americans believe that addressing climate change and reducing emissions is important even when it means redirecting resources from other purposes. We at the University of California have taken substantial steps towards this. UC has completed over 1,000 energy efficiency projects. Only since 2019, UC Clean Power has provided carbon-free electricity across many campuses and health centers. 89% of UCSF's electricity is carbon-free. We have $72 million focused on carbon reduction projects in the pipeline. And we are involved in a $1.5 million decarbonization study to provide a timeline and budget estimate to meet the new 2045 decarbonization targets. We have phenomenal expertise on climate change and health right here on our campuses. In just the past few years, we have become home of the UC Center for Climate Change, Health and Equity and the UCSF Earth Center, which specializes in the study of harmful environmental exposures. What we need now is the active engagement of faculty, staff, students and administration to make changes at every level in which they operate. We need full commitment to rapid major reductions in emissions and the behaviors that contribute to those emissions. I want you to think about the idea of allowable emissions as having a half-life, and we've just discontinued them. We need to cut our emissions in half every two years. That's how we'll get to zero carbon. That's how we'll avoid an increase beyond 1.5 Celsius. We're not going to tell you how to do it, but we are here to help. There are straightforward ways and creative ways to achieve it. This is an opportunity for creative innovation, collaboration, sharing ideas, experimenting, changing how we do business, and relate to our work. This will change how we work, but it's already going to change. There's no question that this is a crisis that will define our lifetimes. We have a choice in how we respond. Do we want to be on the vanguard, set an example, and lead others to achieve this too? Or do we want to lag behind? Some of you have thought about this and may already know what you need to do. Some want a little more information. If you would like to learn more, please visit the sustainability website, which you can access through this QR code. We have resources available to help you understand your carbon footprint and what you can do about it today. There are so many ways to get involved. There are committees to join, organizations to support, and policies to advocate for. Some of you hold purse strings and make decisions, large and small, that will dramatically affect our chances of success. Some of you lead hospitals, clinics, societies, and community-based organizations that can make choices that dramatically cut greenhouse gas emissions. Every day your choices impact the climate. If you're listening to this, you have real power to create this change. One incredible way to get involved that everyone has access to is simple. Start right where you are. Form a group in your program, department, or school. 
Work with your colleagues to make a zero carbon vision and action plan and bring it to life. The more aggressively we cut our emissions, the faster we stabilize the climate of a very important patient, the Earth itself, and protect the lives of all who live upon it. We can no longer advance health worldwide without it. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea and colleagues for a, an inspiring video. And now the Academic Senate Sustainability Committee's subcommittees will update you on current activities. I'd like to introduce you to Katie Brooks, Assistant Professor of Medicine to describe the work of the Speaker Series Subcommittee. Can everybody see those slides okay? Excuse me. For yes, that. perfect. Delay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is um, Katie Brooks. Um, I'm faculty in the Department of Hospital Medicine at San Francisco General, and I'm going to be talking on behalf of uh, Sandra Stavesky and myself. Um, Sandra is faculty in the School of Nursing, and we are the committee co chairs on the Climate Speaker Series. Um, so data shows that talking about the impacts of the changing climate specifically on health is one of the most effective ways to raise awareness on the climate crisis. And as we know, healthcare professionals are some of the most respected um, people in, in our communities. So this means that having an understanding of the climate crisis is a necessary skill and knowledge area for healthcare professionals practicing in the 21st century. Our goal with the speaker series is to create a space for health professionals and other academics um, who are not always engaged in these issues to learn about how the climate crisis is impacting health. The prior series was organized um, just by us on the uh, Senate um, Committee on Sustainability, but this spring we've transitioned to a collaboration with the Center for Climate Equity, um, excuse me, Climate Health and Equity to broaden audience and content expertise. The mission is to raise awareness of the impacts of the climate crisis on health and health inequities with a focus on interdisciplinary discussions of research, policy, advocacy, and clinical solutions. The first session was held um, in March, and it was on the power of evidence-based communication from health professionals. It included two um, experts on communications, particularly in um, the area of climate. In April, the second seminar was on oceans and sea level rise and included a speaker from a local community organization. Coming up in May, we have a session on the intersections between climate and mental health. Next, and um, coming up in June, we will be talking about uh, climate and health impacts on our food systems. For the fall and the next uh, series, which will be an additional four seminars, we hope to discuss health system operations and waste, climate change and medical education, the public health response and reproductive health and respiratory health. Um, to register for these seminar series, you can reach out um, to this email address, climatehealth at ucsf.edu, or to sign up for the center's newsletter um, at this URL. And please feel free to reach out to Sandy or I to share your ideas for upcoming topics or speakers um, for our next sessions. Uh, thank you very much. And I am going to pass off to Sunita Ho, who is professor in um, dental medicine. Can you guys see my screen? Excellent. Thank yes. you very much, Katie. 
Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, as Katie has mentioned, my name is Sunita Ho and I'm a professor in a department of PRDS and urology here on our campus at UCSF. I have been charged with, and I actually took this up on myself, um, to figure out what, how is it that we can create awareness in researchers, especially researchers like myself, who produce a lot of waste almost on a daily basis to do the very research where we are trying to create solutions for better health care. So the question here is why? And from a satellite's point of view, if you actually take a look at our earth, it has so much garbage that we have put on it that needless to say is creating a lot of unhealthy situations for most of us. And this still continues to remain to be seen, especially for the future to come. And this is where I actually take this to hurt, this particular message to hurt. And what I put over here are a bunch of pictures of garbage. And if you look around, you can actually see a lot of garbage. And sometimes I tend to wonder if the number of trees, the amount of garbage outplaces the number of trees on our planet. And this particular work here that I'm going to show about, which is actually in its state of infancy, it is in collaboration with my colleague, Sandy, who is in School of Nursing. So our labs, they produce a lot of waste. And one of the things that we are looking into is actually coming up with a data that is going to allow us to understand how many labs are there and also possibly indicate how much waste we are producing on a daily basis. We produce a ton of waste, a ton of plastic. For those of us who do cell culture studies, we are quite familiar that we produce so much. And also the biohazard waste that gets produced also is incredible. And we also produce a lot of e-waste too. And one of the hidden factors or the nuances with e-waste is we end up using a lot of electricity, a lot of power. And so the, and here's a piece of, here's a piece of information that I was actually able to gather in nature that also talks about how much surplus we have and how much redundancy we built into our system. And this is an ongoing dialogue, not just here in our laboratory, but also with the research resource program that we have here at UCSF. And in this particular case, this gen gentleman, he actually is able to do some uh, research with regards to the amount of surplus at Northwestern University and published his findings in Nature. And he has come to understand that um, there's a lot of waste that we create and it's quite unintended. It's built across this unintended redundancy that we have in our system. So the question is, how can we make our community aware of the central and the functional repository repositories for chemical and instrument surplus to cut down on this redundancy? And where are these repositories here at UCSF? So how do we minimize waste? And we must have heard since our childhood about the three R's, which are reduce, reuse, and recycle. I would like to just focus on reduce. I would like to ask all of you to focus on just reduce. And by reducing, you do not have that much effort. You don't need to put that much effort in terms of reusing or recycling. The reduction process is what we need to do. So how do we minimize waste? in the first place. And this is actually the spirit with which we are trying to create an awareness to reduce the waste through an online training process. And this is similar to the laboratory safety for researchers. If you're wondering how is that going to look like, something along the lines of the laboratory safety for researchers, especially those who are wet lab researchers are quite familiar with this. And this is how it looks like or would look like. Um, it would be posted on a learning center, on um, UCSF Learning Center. And this is where you have some of the trainings that we all are um, required to take. And what we are hoping is we would have yet another training that basically says leave no trace, very similar to what the video has um, informed all of you with. And this particular leave no trace is going to be not just for wet lab users, but also for dry lab users. And as we have indicated, there's a lot of power usage by dry lab users as well. And can we also perform waste audits along this for both dry as well as wet lab users? So these are some of the things that we are trying to work with. And where are we with this? Well, we are collaborating with My Green Lab, which is a nonprofit organization that already has built various modules on wet and dry lab related research waste. 
And we are discussing about the material to create awareness in researchers, both young and old alike. It's not just students. PIs also have to be very much involved in this and create that necessary awareness and discuss with UC Learning to create the learning module, um, the learning and the training module. This actually is being undertaken by my colleague whom I have introduced to you, Sandy. So one thing that I also would want to call to your attention and most likely I don't have to about this, but needless I will. Garbage is not just on earth, garbage is around our earth too. And so here we have, let's not forget space junk. Uh, this is a personal message. Um, so we ask, what is your obligation and responsibility, and can you help us in building this learning module? So if you guys have any feedback or would you like to join hands with us, we are more than um, we uh, welcome that, and we look forward to hearing from you. And thank you very much. And I would like to uh, pass the baton, so to speak, to Seema Gandhi, who is a medical director of sustainability for UCSF Health. And she will be discussing on efforts uh, to reduce medical waste at UCSF. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you, Dr. Zlatnik and the Senate for having me. It's a great opportunity and I'm Excited to share um, what um, is my screen? Can everyone see it? Just yes. Yes. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Uh, and I'm really excited to share about uh, the whole concept of let's rethink medical waste and let's rethink why it's important and what we can do about it. Now, the whole topic and each sort of subtopics here we could talk about for hours, but for the next 10 minutes, I want to focus on medical waste. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Anesthesia, the Medical Director of Sustainability for UCSF Health, and uh, really passionate about this. And partly it's because I've seen healthcare practiced in the UK, where I trained, and also in India. And I think that sort of begs to evidence-based practices and how we've got here and what we can do about it. Um, so... And I'm sure many of you have sort of in the last two years been inundated with lots of information about climate change and the role of healthcare in climate change. And I just put a few things up for people like me that are mainly want to operationalize this, right? We have the data and how do we transition to like clinical operations? And I think that a big step for me, and I often thank President Biden, is when President Biden and 40 national leaders pledged to decrease emissions from healthcare, it has led to a cascade of events. Most recently, a joint commission has said environmental sustainability will be a part of their strategic priority. And this is huge for anyone that practices in this area and fears the words joint commission, right? And similarly, National Academy of Medicine has come up with reduction targets. University of California system under the leadership of Kerry Byington, we actually have pledged to decarbonize and we've signed what is popularly known as the White House Climate Pledge. So lots of stuff happening. We have a lot of targets that we have to meet as a health system. And so why is that the case? And now I don't need to tell anyone on this screen, but we are at trillion dollars, the most expensive healthcare in the world. And while nationally, um, 8.5 or 9% of emissions come from U.S. healthcare. Globally, healthcare accounts for about 4 to 5% in other countries, right? U.K. healthcare emissions are about 4%. So why are U.S. healthcare emissions twice its peers? We've seen most during COVID, we had a vulnerable healthcare. We haven't built resilience. And the more we keep using supplies and stuff, the more vulnerable we are. Right. We're an inequitable healthcare system because the emissions, the 8.5 or 10 percent of emissions that we generate from healthcare impact people that have the least to do with it. We know that the underserved population sees the impact of climate change and emissions the most. And what also concerns me that we're not very sustainable in the definition that don't have a surplus of supplies. And you see this label of back orders, but we have hundreds of supplies that have been on back order. 
Every day we get an email about, we don't have one supply or the other. So I think we really have to think about whether our current practice is going to last us for the decades to come, right? So where do emissions, and I know there's a lot of word about emissions from healthcare and decarbonization and waste reduction, where does all of this come from? Right now, I think this is a landmark paper because this looked at where emissions in US healthcare comes from. And for the researchers out there, we similarly have a grant right now where we're trying to map where emissions at UCSF Health are coming from. And emissions are divided into three categories, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And I'll go through these quickly because I wanna focus on medical waste for today's topic. But scope one is really the emissions that you generate from your building. So anesthesia gases are scope one. Refrigerants in our hospital system come in scope one. Scope two is the energy that we purchase to really run our building. And scope three is the stuff that we use. In US, about 80% of emissions come from scope three. Think about that for a second. All the stuff that we use, the food, the plastic, the supplies, the devices, the labs, the travel, everything is in scope three. So if you come up with the greenest, most electrified building, we're not going to get to our net zero decarbonization goals unless we actually start focusing on scope three. Right. So whatever your field of interest is, and this is how I, in this role over the last seven or eight years, have morphed what I am doing. I started off as a clinical person, mainly focused on mitigation. And the more I work in this space, I realize the need for education and the re need for advocacy and getting involved in policies. But whatever your interest is, whether it's education, QI, pure research, just focusing on operations and mitigations, or wanting to get your voice heard at a policy level, there is something for all of us to do in the space of decarbonization and waste reduction. And some of the things that we've done in sort of education engagement is slowly we've started creating sustainability committee. We started with the operating rooms because as an anesthesiologist, it was an area I was familiar with, but also because that's where most of the waste is used, right? Most recently, every single unit, our goal is to have a QR code. And I'll talk about that in a second. And last year, we were excited to showcase our inaugural waste to art event. In research, you know, we'll talk about a few publications on actually where is the waste coming and what we're doing about it and some examples of mitigation projects. But again, policy and really advocating for evidence-based practices with your policy and decisions maker is very, very huge. Similarly to what something Sunita said, it's important to really rethink, right? And I like to call this the new paradigm for sustainability in healthcare. Because while it's important to reduce and recycle, but if you rethink and really don't make, you know, ensure that the waste is not generated. If a patient doesn't need a lab, then we don't order that lab. If we need to open five gloves, then we don't open 10 gloves, right? If we don't need an x-ray, then we don't get an x-ray. So really rethink and looking as far upstream as you can is going to be a really big solution. And some things that we're working on right now is single use devices. But the other thing is to refuse. And, and I think that our supply chain and our procurement managers at the office of the president are trying to go towards environmental friendly purchasing. Reduce, and these are all examples of three QI projects that perioperative residents and anesthesia residents have taken on in reducing our usage of hotline, uh, unnecessary warming devices and patient transport devices. Reprocessing, many of you might be familiar with reprocessing, where we convert a single use device and use it multiple times. And then for the supplies that we actually use is how do we recycle? Right. So this is the QR code. We're just triaging this effort. It's a tool that we've created at UCSF and we're very excited about it because it gives you an opportunity to help identify where waste is. Well, we know as a team, we can't get everywhere. And we have different um, 
workflow opportunities, whether it's in supplies, pharmacy, energy, water, and then it tells you which unit in your area of work. And then our team at the back will triage it and help really understand where the waste is coming from and cater solutions for it. So there's a QR code here. And again, I'll put my email. Please reach out and we're very happy to partner with people in the lab if you want something like this to go in the labs as well. Right. Over the last few years, um, a few research opportunities, right? We published extensively. One was on how do we decrease anesthesia gas emission? And we were able to create a tool that prompt anesthesia providers on where too much excessive gas was used. Because anesthesia gases are potent greenhouse gases. Uh, the other thing is to really partner with our surgeons and understand what they think, where the waste is coming from. And that was very interesting because our surgeons and staff said, yes, waste is a problem. They know it's a problem, but they really want to do something about it. So, you know, we, we've talked about them. We have a qualitative study and we're further looking at perioperative modules. A big thing and coming from some of the audits that we've done, we found that textiles was a very big component. So we have big efforts on right now to convert to reusable textiles. So what we did, um, and this was a few years ago, is we um, audited about 150 cases in the operating room and found out that you know there was foam, textiles, uh, unused supplies, soft plastic, hard plastic, other supplies that were contaminated and not recyclable. So based on this, we created a dashboard and we started looking at how do we address each and every of those items. So foam is an item that you have here, which is used to position patients in the operating room. And now we have converted in many operating rooms to reusable gel. We're not all the way there, but the process has started. So that's something that we took on. What we're very excited about is we took on a two-year worth pilot at Mount Zion and Mission Bay Hospitals to really convert to reusable textiles. Now, about 30% of our waste comes from textiles. And each oper operation or surgery generates about 30 to 50 pounds of landfill waste. We've partnered with surgeons, other companies for sterilization and cleaning, and this has been an absolute success. So we're very happy to do that. And you know, there are a lot of other QI projects, but some things that were ongoing. Uh, similarly, what we're working on is a scorecard, right? You know, we have different researchers, we have different surgeons performing the same surgery. And what we're able to give them now uh, in a selected pilot is scorecards on how they're performing. And it tells them how much water they're using in their surgery based on calculations from a sterile processing, uh, how much pounds they have and the number of single use devices and what their sustainability um, index is compared to the rest of their peers and the supplies that they're using. We were finally able to convert this also into miles driven and uh, the pilot starts in two weeks, but it's taken a long time to build this tool. So we're very excited to uh, move that along as well. Right. Um, Lastly, I know that um, the Office of Sustainability with Dan Hondroyd and his team are also working on downstream waste diversion. Now, I, I said in my second slide is UCOP, the Office of the President has set goals on how we're going to get toward pounds per patient day, adjusted pounds per patient day. UCSF Health is right now at 41 pounds of adjusted patient um, waste per day. And our goal by 2030 is to get to 25 pounds. And this is the goal that all the UCs across all campuses have to align by. So it's a very lofty target. And again, we're not going to get there just by recycling, which is important. But we really need to think upstream, as upstream as we can, to make sure we only use what is actually necessary. Uh, there are uh, groups and a lot of support. If you want bins in your locations, signages, we partnered with companies to look at some downstream waste audits as well. Right. And, and so just to summarize, you know, some of the things that we've done, and, and this is a roadmap we've created with like the pounds waste for some things. And, you know, there's like 30 tons, 10 tons on different isolation gowns. Reprocessing has saved us quite a bit. Um, and then in addition, as you can see, the surgeons 
they were so excited wearing the reusable gowns. They tweeted on Earth Day saying, hey, we're really happy to use these gowns and we can't wait for them to come to UCSF Health. So lots of effort happening. Um, please let us know if there's any way we can collaborate and um, share some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. And I just wanted to showcase some of the creative work that was done by um, just staff and providers at um, UCSF Health for the inaugural Wave Day event. And I think the one that really struck was um, the little whale here where they cut IV bags and stuffed it with waste and said in the belly of the beast, because as Sunita showed, there's a lot of waste in our oceans. There is going to be more um, plastic than fish in the next five years. So um, there's a waste of art event next week. We hope you can come and visit and see some of the amazing art pieces that are created. Uh, my email is here again and um, look to hearing from you. With that, I also want to introduce um, inspirational Dr. Gundling, who is a professor emeritus in the Department of Medicine and the current vice chair for the Senate Sustainability Committee. Thank you, Seema. Um, so inspirational to hear all of these discussions about what's happening. And um, today I would like to just spend a few minutes, I'll move quickly, talking about um, one of the projects that our academic Senate theme year is focusing on, which is evolving the culture of academic travel. And I'd like to thank my fellow committee member, Dr. Katie Brooks, who played a mighty role in helping to prepare this presentation. So um, first, just a moment on the culture of academic travel project. It was um, begun in 2020 um, by Colin Balin and Stephen Edinger, two of our medical students who were concerned about the health emergency of climate change and wanted to be able to do something. Um, thanks to the support of the Carbon Neutrality Initiative through UC Office of the President and Gail Lee at our Office of Sustainability, they began to ask questions. And one question is, can we travel better? So we need to focus, they were thinking, not only on the impact of climate change on our patients' health, but also on uh, our impact on climate change. What is our greenhouse gas emissions and our footprint? So they were asking as time passed, and we interviewed a number of faculty members in focus groups, um, can we also enhance academic equity by making um, an evolution, a change in the culture of the way we travel? Can we improve faculty quality of life and in the process heal our communities and the planet by decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so that brings up the question, how does UCSF travel? Where are our greenhouse gas emissions? That is a hard question to answer because as you know, many of us actually uh, make our own travel arrangements and UC may never learn about this data. But estimations are available and we know that in 2009, for example, approximately 8% of UCSF's total greenhouse gas emissions came from air travel of faculty and staff. And that kept increasing to 2018 to be about 15%. And by using extrapolation from other universities and our best guess, at that time, it was estimated that that actual amount may be closer to 30% of UCSF's total greenhouse gas emissions. But that's not accurate by any means, and certainly we're awaiting data for post-pandemic trends as well. Now, of note, we've already heard about the massive um, impact on global warming of the US healthcare system, which is estimated to account for about 25% of global healthcare emissions. But I do want you to note that this does not include the contribution of academic travel. So if you were to include that, that number would be a lot higher probably. So where is our travel logged? Probably just here in the US EPA's 2023 greenhouse gas inventory, um, just sort of lumped in with all of transportation, which is the largest um, source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Much more to talk about, but we need to move on. For perspective, one round trip flight from San Francisco to JFK emits about a thousand kilograms of CO2, depending upon the size of the plane, um, how new it is, 
if you make any stops and a variety of other um, factors, but also does not include the damage done to the atmosphere um, by the contrails. The average American passenger car emits about 4,600 kilograms per year of CO2, and the average person estimated globally emits about 4,700 kilograms of CO2, obviously depending on a lot of factors. But what you can see here is that it doesn't take too many air flights to really make us stand out in our contribution in greenhouse gas emissions and hence to climate change. So um, at, now I'd like to present to you in these conversations that we had with a number of our faculty at UCSF in the depth of the shutdown from the pandemic, what they observed and what they recommended, what insights they shared with us about how they used to travel, how it had changed during the pandemic, and their recommendations for how we can travel better in the future to reflect our values. We condensed this to four pillars of action. Number one, clarify guidance from leadership about the necessity of travel for career advancement. Um, so it was clear from almost all our faculty that there is a clear culture of expectation that faculty should travel to enhance career success, but few individuals had been provided with guidelines. Um, and this came to play with a number of younger faculty, especially, who told us that they would travel when in doubt because it was thought uh, to be important that they be able to put that travel on their CV. But yet it might have interfered with their home life and caused them to have to obtain child care. Um, they, of course, didn't have, they weren't able just to give up clinical time, they would have to make that up. And certainly in laboratories, it's very disruptive to have to travel more than you need to. So some of the comments we heard also pertained a lot to um, our values. One on the left is our system at the university for how you advance is in direct conflict with all these conversations we were having in 2020 about climate change, social injustice, and decolonizing. That was a new junior faculty member. Another faculty member said, we're reviewed based on whether we've been invited to give talks. So how we are assessed as faculty has to change if we want to travel better, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and reflect our values. And one senior faculty member summed it up by saying, if any good is coming out of this pandemic, it's certainly making our threshold of necessary travel much, much higher. Um, all right, number two, empower faculty to become stewards of their carbon footprints. We love data. If we had more data, we could make better decisions about how we conduct our activities. We need greater visibility as to the carbon footprint of different activities, said a senior faculty member. And a logical question, is one international flight the equivalent of two national flights in terms of climate impact? And how about commuting to work? If I take my bicycle to work, does that buy me two national flights? Or energy use um, in laboratories? With increased data, our faculty can make decisions to both help themselves and help the planet. All right, number three, develop and support hybrid formats for meetings and conferences. Our faculty would like to be acknowledged for their innovative academic contributions towards optimizing virtual meetings, including virtual presentations, teaching skills, and leadership roles. And we learned that a number of our faculty have really developed creative ways to communicate virtually. And wouldn't it be great if they could receive credit for this when it comes time for advancement and promotion? They even suggested creating a center of excellence in virtual communications. And that would also enhance UCSF's reputation. They suggested utilizing hybrid formats to promote academic equity, excuse me, equity in science. And one of the things they were learning during the pandemic shutdown is they were hearing from voices that they never heard before, from people who lived a long ways away or did not have the ability to afford to come to international meetings. They said it was so much fun and so interesting to hear these voices. And they even learned new ways of looking at scientific endeavors and spreading that information, not only to colleagues, but to the public. 
So more support is needed for developing skills in the virtual environment. That was a consensus. Please support us as faculty to advance these skills. All right, number four, advanced solutions that can be adopted broadly by academic organizations. Well, one of the things that we learned is faculty were in these focus groups having discussions about our values at UCSF. And they said that many of the things that we do, such as supporting diversity, equity, inclusion, um, looking at anti-racism policies, um, supporting and defending health justice. We do these things because they're the right thing to do, and maybe it will have a larger impact. And they were looking at climate change and its impact on health and our impact on climate change the same way. We are all this in, in this together, said a mid-level faculty member. And another senior faculty member said, we need to look at this in a very systemic and systematic way. So looking at it quite thoroughly, what we do and what changes we need to make so that our change in academic travel reflects these values. Um, yes, so it is a good question to ask, um, can I attend this meeting virtually? But they stress there's way more to it than that. And one of our senior faculty members said, coming out with guidelines at UCSF that we can adhere to that might be shared by the UC system will then help set the precedent for other academic institutions, emphasizing that we are all in this together, but we do have a big influence. So we need a few bold leaders across academic medicine to step forward and establish an enlightened new normal that will end the academic travel arms race, heal our patients, ourselves, and the planet. And if you'd like to join us in this effort, we have there's so much more that we learned over the last couple of years, and we would love to have you join us in any of these efforts. But to start, think about building on any of these ideas that I presented here, or you may just want to ask your department chair if it's time to update expectations for academic travel and not just update, but clarify. And what else can we include in there that will give us acknowledgement for activities in climate health and sustainability. Um, our emails are here. Please feel free to contact us. You've already seen these additional resources. So last, I would like to thank some of the folks who really helped um, make this project move forward. And with that, I will end the screen share. And I would like to now introduce, um, stop share. I would like to introduce our next speakers who are two of our committee members, Mark Seilstead, who will be talking about electrification issues. And you've already met Chelsea Landolin, who'll be talking about commun uh, commuting. So thank you very much. And please let us know if you have any questions. All right, hello everyone. Um, see, I will be I will be presenting for both of our uh, groups today. Um, Mark, uh, please feel free to jump in as you'd like. Um, so I'm uh, I'm a former chair. Uh, just a moment, I need to do one thing to fix my fix my screen sharing. Just a moment. Thank you for your patience. There we are. Okay. All right. So um, I'm I'm excited to uh, share with you some of the uh, updates that we have as part of the electrification and uh, commuting subcommittee, part of the academic senate um, committee on sustainability. Um, I am the current co-chair um, of, of, of this committee, um, the subcommittee, along with, um, and as well as former chair of, of, the, of the committee as a whole. Um, uh, I'm, I'm here with Mark Seilstad, who's just been an incredible partner in our efforts to move the needle on emissions. As you heard in the video, uh, we do treat zero carbon as the goal. Uh, most of our committee members are not professionals in the climate change space, so 
part of part of what we have to do is to educate ourselves in order to have an appropriate impact um, on this issue. Um, we've learned a lot about the general um, as well as the specific issues involved um, in that are driving uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, on the campus. Uh, for example, um, some of the general issues um, that are not specific to, uh, to being a health sciences campus per se, I have listed on the right, um, you know, being a large organization, have, providing our own, own power, um, we, we are burning natural gas in order to do that. We are, uh, there's some electricity that is purchased um, and that electricity, some of that is created by burning fossil fuels. Um, obviously, travel, um, use, use of gas-powered cars for the commute, um, numerous barriers to low and no-carbon commutes uh, like bike theft, um, unsafe bike lanes, um, as well as underutilization of public transit, particularly um, uh, after, after the start of the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, in general, there are always issues with um, inefficiencies in, in buildings um, and um, suboptimal use of space. Um, as well as issues uh, just uh, that, we, that we face as people. Um, we all have certain attitudes and behaviors and we have a fair bit of habit strength um, around our behaviors. Um, there's also variable willingness to take decisive action on, the, on these issues. And like I raised in the video, um, climate change has numerous issues uh, related to, or implications regarding, uh, you know, equity and justice. And we have to be sure that as we are addressing these issues, we are aware of that and aware of any unconscious bias um, and acceptance of structural inequities that we may have um, so that we uh, remain adequately motivated um, to move forward on, on these issues. In addition to uh, those general issues, that uh, we have specific ones um, that apply to our campus. Um, we have uh, in the in the research space, issues like a uh, very heavy energy draw of free, of the low temperature freezers and fume hoods, um, a need for very reliable backup power to ensure that we that uh, the power is never out um, for these sensitive samples and so forth. Um, our hospital and hospitals and clinics, as you've heard, anesthesia gases are a major source of emissions. Um, plastic medical waste, um, pharmaceutical manufacturing, um, as mentioned earlier, um, incredibly incre incredible sources of, gas, of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, similarly, issues with backup power and um, issues about in-person versus, uh, versus uh, remote visits, um, which are impacted by uh, the regulatory environment as well as decisions made locally. Uh, teaching uh, in teaching, we deal with questions about remote versus in-person learning, and what is the best format uh, for uh, for the content being delivered. Also related to our teaching work, um, in-person admission interviews uh, for the schools um, also have a significant um, em emissions uh, impact. Uh, and as noted earlier, jet and car travel for conferences. So these are just some of them, and um, but but there are more. So one of, one of the things that we are trying to do here um, is, is really to help, help people move forward. Many people support climate action and they mean quite well. Um, behavior change and budget change though take intention and motivation to enact. Um, so we're developing communications to help address motivational barriers um, and to share ideas about how to conceive of the problem so that it can in fact be solved. Um, the video you saw is an example of this, and there's more and more to do. Um, this year and next year are theme years uh, for decarbonization within the academic senate. Um, this has given us a wonderful opportunity uh, to engage faculty governance to elevate issues of decarbonization with all committees. We've been meeting with academic senate committee uh, members, uh, such as space, um, to find areas of synergy. Um, an example of overlap is like the dedications of space to indoor uh, bicycle parking in order to increase the numbers of people who are cycling to campus. Um, the way that we dedicate space uh, to freezers and so forth, all of these are uh, different ways that we overlap. 
um, and as well as with other committees. So uh, we engage with in similar meetings with campus and health system leaders in order to ensure that decarbonization is on the agenda all over the campus. Um, and based on these meetings, we will be determining in the upcoming months whether there are policies that uh, need to be changed if we're, we are to properly accelerate our decarbonization efforts, uh, which we will take up, take up the chain um, as appropriate. All right. Um, Let's see, we, and we are also just starting to look into accountability mechanisms for greenhouse gas emissions. This is very early. Um, and so all I would say about this is we encourage folks to share ideas with us about what approaches will allow us to achieve zero carbon um, in the best possible way. So we are part of a much larger movement to decarbonize UC. The fossil free memorial was endorsed by UC faculty in 2022. Um, it's important to recognize for precisely how aggressive these targets are. In order to achieve them, they really do require immediate action. So 60% reduction by 20, uh, 2030 and 95% by 2035. The original um, draft of the memorial was even more aggressive than this one. Okay. We have also been pleased to be part of the bicycle micromobility master plan development. Um, this was a focus in years prior um, to the announcement of, of this, uh, this work, um, and it's been so exciting to see it come to life. Um, it really is an excellent report. I have a link here. Um, what's important now is that we implement the recommendations, and so we are pushing for full integration of this report um, into campus planning. And I want to appreciate Mark uh, for his, his role um, on, on that committee. Okay, so just one final slide about how you can get involved. Um, we really do need your help to win over the whole campus to this effort. Uh, please get the word out that we do need to discontinue GHGs. So DC GHGs, remember that. Um, uh, we will share this video with the campus. Please encourage others to watch. Um, and if you have ideas or connections that will help us move the needle, um, please meet with us. Um, contact me or Mark or our analyst, um, Liz Greenwood, um, in order to do that. We do encourage you to build your understanding of your carbon footprint. Uh, use, please use one of the uh, carbon calculators that are available. I have a couple of them listed here uh, to, to get started with that. We also welcome you. Um, to, to join uh, one of the two UCSF sustainability committees. There's the Academic Senate Committee as well as the University Advisory Committee on Sustainability. Um, there are also uh, UCSF student groups for those, those who are students, um, as I have listed here. And beyond UCSF, joining a professional organization that does this, does this work um, is, is a great, great way to get involved. Uh, we encourage you to check out uh, these other links um, to resources on campus and the centers that we mentioned earlier um, that are always offering events and resources and opportunities. Um, and I also here have a link uh, to the grassroots advocacy efforts occurring for, within the UC system if you'd like to, like to learn more. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I will pass the baton now. Uh, to let's see, uh, Katie Lichter um, and Ali uh, Savag will be talking about about their work as as trainees. Please go ahead. Great, thanks, Chelsea. Um, and I'll let Ali share the slides here if you have them. Um, but hi, everyone. My name is Katie, and I am a resident in the Department of Radiation Oncology. I'm really excited with, to talk to you all today with Ali um, about resident and trainee engagement in sustainability and decarbonization. Um, so Ali, feel free to, to jump to the second slide. Um, but as I entered residency in 2020 amongst a pandemic, as well as a climate crisis that could be intimately felt uh, here in California as wildfires were ablaze across the state. Um, I found that it wasn't just myself, but it was many other trainees and medical students that were really looking to get engaged in issues of sustainability and climate health. 
Um, with this motivation um, and impetus for change, it actually led us to launch the Green Health Lab here out of uh, UC, which brings together uh, residents, trainees, medical students across the UC system, um, and even nationally, really to become actively engaged in projects on sustainability, decarbonization, and mitigation. Um, and so we're really excited. Um, I'm going to introduce Ali here uh, to talk to you about one of our efforts here that really fits in nicely with it, everything that we've been hearing about, especially with uh, Dr. Gunling's work around academic travel. So um, Ali is a postdoc in our lab, um, and he also is part of the Department of Radiation Oncology. So I'll let you take it from here, Ali. Thank you, Katie. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to our project, um, the Network Greener Initiative. Um, so like we've talked about before, carbon neutrality is a big goal for UCSF by 2025. Um, and as everyone said, you know, scope three is uh, the biggest category of emissions that we can tackle now. And it's responsible for an unknown but substantial amount of emissions, specifically when it comes to business travel and conference attendance. Uh, so that's what we wanted to address with this initiative, attending conferences. So as we all know, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to attending conferences, mainly networking, learning about new research, new data that's published, um, career advancement opportunities, and credit card points if you're into that. Um, you know, but it is uh, a source of massive emissions, as everyone has, you know, um, mentioned before in the presentations, as well as inequities when it comes to access. So specifically people who have caregiver responsibilities, uh, people who are coming internationally, uh, you know, they, they might have like a visa block, uh, as well as the financial um, aspect of attending a conference. So um, because of that, we wanted to offer people a tool that will let them decide whether or not attending a conference is um, worth it from an environmental perspective uh, to give them um, sort of a of a clue as to how many emissions are associated with their attendance. We saw what's already available. So for example, with Google Flights, people can actually see how much their round trip flight is going to be, um, how many emissions are associated with the round trip flight, but it doesn't really account for their lodging, uh, their days of attendance, going to the conference center itself, et cetera. Um, and for UCSF department heads, making the decision of sending your faculty or staff to a conference, there is some research on that, and there is some estimates that you can come up with, but it's very time and labor intensive. Uh, it takes a lot of calculations. So we wanted to make that simpler for everyone. And we thought to ourselves, you know, what if we had an easily accessible decision-making tool, um, something where uh, UCSF community members can go into, uh, put in the details of their, of their um, conference attendance, where they're flying uh, from and where to, how long they're staying, where they can get an estimate of the travel-related emissions and make a decision based on that, as well as seeing how they themselves can make everyday changes to their lifestyle in order to sort of offset uh, the emissions that come with attending this conference. And also, we wanted to make it geared toward conference organizers, as well as department heads at UCSF and people who can make change in policies by seeing how much uh, sending faculty and staff and UCSF members to these conferences can account uh, or how many emissions um, are due to this uh, to, to their projects and also seeing how many can be reduced by adopting sort of a hybrid format. Uh, and with that, we came up with the beta version of the calculator that I'm hoping to uh, demo to you today. Um, it's also accessible uh, using the QR code and the website. Um, so yeah, let me just... And uh, if you want to see my screen, right? So, you know, you go to Network Greener, and this is where individuals can see how many emissions are associated with their conference travel. You put in the details of where you're going. So I think an example Dr. Gundry gave before was going from um, San Francisco to JFK. Uh, so let's try that one. And let's say that someone is staying at a conference for um, four days, and they're staying at a hotel or an Airbnb. So the calculator would give the person um, an estimate of the carbon footprint, how much the distance is, and 
if they were to attend virtually or you know it's a hybrid format, how much they can reduce from those emissions. Um, then they're giving the they're given options to modify their lifestyle. So if they adopt these changes for a year, um, how much of these emissions can they actually offset? So let's say that someone wants to recycle for a year, it would offset 0.21 uh, metric tons of CO2. If they want to only eat local food, it would offset this much and eventually it accumulates. Uh, living car free, actually great, goes with scope three of UCSF emissions, uh, you know, transit take, carpooling, et cetera. And then for conference organizers, as well as apartment heads, we wanted to offer an, a, another option where they can get, you know, kind of a ballpark estimate of the emissions associated with attending, uh, with having or hosting this conference. Let's say they have a thousand US participants and say 500 international participants, they get an estimate of uh, the CO2 waste associated with the conference, as well as um, a sort of a, a sort of an estimation of uh, the reduction associated with hosting the, the conference in a hybrid format. And you know, we also wanted to thank our sponsors and partners. We have the UCSF Office of Sustainability, UCSF Economic Senate, and other organizations as well. Uh, so we really want to encourage people to use the tool. Uh, let us know what you think. It's still in beta version. So of course, there are some things that we would like to um, adjust, but this is just our way of um, you know helping out and hopefully making an impact. So yeah, thank you. Um, and with that, um, and I would like to introduce um, Aaron Gore, Senior Vice Chancellor of uh, Finance and Administration. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of the great uh, content here so far. We are excited to be a uh, part of this and I'm excited to give a pretty significant update along with uh, the help of my colleagues, John Giacomi and Amit, uh, to just give an update from where we were uh, and when we all met in September and where we're going. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we kind of just incorporate into many of our presentations where, where Myra started. And I think that similar to the kickoff of that great video, it's just remembering that this is the biggest health crisis that we have and aligns with our values. So as we think of both the expense and the heavy lift to make all the changes that we've all talked about here today, keep this type of quote front and center. As we go to the next slide, um, we're gonna give updates on the fossil-free planning. And so as uh, discussed by one of my colleagues earlier, there was an umbrella kicked off by the Academic Senate, which we have picked up and I sit on the system-wide committee. So we'll give the updates uh, for UCSF there. Uh, the Parnassus Central Utility Plant has been mentioned a couple times, definitely the, the elephant in our fossil fuel strategy. So I want to address some questions uh, head on about that and its future. Uh, my colleague, John Giacomi, will talk about the fossil free study and consulting update that's been referenced a few times. He'll give some highlights of our new exciting buildings, as well as the decarbonization project highlights. Uh, finally, we will wrap up with transportation services, which will kind of give you both uh, a sense of how your transportation may be influencing uh, the type three admissions that we've talked about and just where we're going to make all of our services that we provide centrally there uh, more electric. With that, I'm gonna go into some of the details of the update. Uh, the first one in terms of fossil free fuel goal, our governance has been established here on campus and you'll hear a little bit more later, but we're studying the overall electrification of the campus and the future of, the, of all of our campus utilities, Mission Bay, Mount Zion, UCSF Fresno and BCH Oakland. Uh, the rough estimated cost for this type of replacement is uh, huge. We have spoken to OP, we're speaking to the state, we're looking at federal uh, programs. We definitely will need um, some sort of subsidized uh, low cost financing uh, to accomplish the goal, but I'll say that many very smart people who are motivated are working on that. Uh, we're continuing our energy reduction projects. These are important because as we work on the big, uh, large, audacious goal, 
uh, what can we do, you know, day in and day out uh, to reduce our energy uh, usage. So we have some of the, the highlights there, both for health and for campus. We are uh, looking at converting our shuttle fleet to electric vehicles, especially ones that don't have the problem that we talked about in September of some of the, the ones that we had before uh, not being a good fit with our streets in San Francisco and making people car sick. So the $1 million estimate there is to get a new electric shuttle, test it out that it works in our environment, and then start the plan both for uh, converting all of our fleet, but in addition to that, um, looking at all the vehicles on campus. In addition, the transportation team put in a request uh, to Nancy Pelosi's office. We won't know till the fall if we were successful, but again, trying every lever we can uh, to be able to partner with others to either provide resources or low-cost financing to keep this program moving. Uh, we'll talk more about the electric buildings. This lists about six um, that we're doing. So again, the electrification uh, is a high priority and a requirement on all new facilities. Just want to call out, as we have earlier, there are a number of research collaborations. So we called out, of course, the UC Center for Climate Health and Equity housed here at UCSF. Um, you see health, there's many others. So this short changes the great use of resources that we are all trying to um, tap into on our own campus and on the other campuses in the system. And just wanna make sure that we highlight uh, the focus on existing curriculum and just embedding sustainability and decarbonization into all of our learner experiences. Finally, I'll talk in more detail in just a moment. Uh, there is a system-wide environmental social justice sprint under the fossil free fuel umbrella. And I am one of the co-leaders of that. So again, making sure that we're really focused on both what are the uh, social impacts of our choices um, going forward. So this just gives the social cost of carbon that we have been using at 246 per metric ton. Um, so as talked about in the video, for us, that's about $22 million a year. We're working on a system-wide standard. So as we think about both the cost to invest in new technology, uh, we wanna make sure we're including what the cost is of our current um, fossil-free, our, our current fossil-based approach. On the system-wide environmental justice, environmental justice is that minority and low-income communities bear disproportionately the burden of environmental hazards. Uh, clearly, as we saw in the video, the impact on air, water, soil pollution. They also reap disproportionately fewer of the benefits of some of the infrastructure investments for water, sanitation, electricity, and access to clean technologies. The environmental focus on the environmental justice is the op opposite, equal protection from the environmental hazards and equal access to environmental benefits. Uh, this work is kicking off in May. Um, what is inspiring about these sprints is it's sort of the anti-bureaucracy. It's a concentrated effort for four to six weeks. Uh, my co-lead has not been named, but they have put out an ask. So hopefully we will be announcing that shortly. And we're currently evaluating as we put together the sprint that for our local UCSF uh, work in this area, is it better for us to do a multi-campus approach or a standalone approach? And so as the sprint is uh, scoped, go, let's go to the next slide, we'll evaluate how we bring this work to, to UCSF. So you can see the three um, workflows. So first is, Assessing the vulnerability of labor and surrounding communities on the transition from fossil fuel. Um, you know, we currently have people who work here at the central utility plant. So this transition will definitely impact them and what can we do to support them uh, during that transition. Second, develop and evaluate equity indicators on the transition impacts and opportunities. And then fourth, incorporate these four major climate and environmental justice concepts into the work we're doing. 
This gives a picture of a tour that I and a few recently took of the PCAP, our central utility plant, to understand how it works. So on the roadmap to decarbonization, there needs to be a shift away from our natural gas dependence. And here are the critical steps. Number one, reduce the heating required by all of our buildings and improve energy efficiency. Uh, you've heard about this work for years and we are continuing it. Number two, converting our building systems from steam to low temperature heating hot water. Our major buildings, including the hospital, uh, have steam piping throughout. So significant infrastructure modifications are required to operate on an efficient decarbonized heating hot water system. Studies are underway. And then finally, number three, install new electric heat pumps at PCUP or elsewhere on a campus energy loop. Heat pumps are the foundation of a efficient decarbonized campus heating and cooling system. They use electricity to effect, efficiently generate low temperature heating hot water for heating and chilled water for cooling. Again, we have studies underway. The question I get asked most often is, could UCSF turn off the, the Parnas cogeneration co plant immediately? And we can't. Um, Number one, it provides all of the heating to the Parnassus campus and our only um, heating alternative without investment and the work by the study underway would be fossil, fossil fuel burning boilers. So, you know, we need to actually look and make the investment uh, for some new technology. The, the second big issue is that the PCAP currently is our electrical resiliency. So the PCAP can power the Parnassus buildings, including the hospital, whether or not the, the PG&E grid is having some sort of hiccup. Um, you know, PG&E is making critical electrical grid improvements in San Francisco. The work is still in progress. They have made some very big statements, uh, which we are working on better understanding about uh, additional resiliency just to hospitals. But currently, the PCAP is the resiliency to make sure that the electricity is always working uh, in the hospital. And with that, I will turn it over to John Giacomi, who is uh, now the Assistant Vice Chancellor over all of Campus Life Services. Uh, as I turn it over to him, I will give a small congratulations to our longtime campus leader. Uh, we had a national search and he just took over the role of uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Campus Life Services while we were putting this presentation together. So John, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks Aaron, and uh, happy to be here everyone. Um, first, I'd like to a big shout out to uh, Bruce Mace and Anna Levitt from ECSF Health and Paul Landry and Benjamin Levy from uh, Campus uh, Energy Management and Gail Lee, our Sustainability Director. A lot of, a lot of people have been working on these issues for a long time, and uh, it's great to see everything coming together. So I think uh, people may know that there is going to be a, a decarbonization study at every UC campus throughout the entire system. Um, we've been given $1.5 million to conduct this study. We think that will come pretty close to uh, covering it. So Ben and Anna and others have uh, put out a request for qualifications. We've had nine companies respond to that RFQ. And uh, during the month of May, so starting next week, they'll be reviewing those options and developing a short list. And so, like I said, all UCs are going through this process. And I think we're a little bit ahead of uh, many of the campuses at this point. So every study um, commissions that there be five overall deliverables to President Drake and to Chancellor Hoggood. And so we'll be working on those five deliverables. Just wanna let you know that the study will cover the first two deliverables. And then there's three remaining deliverables, which I'll outline in a little bit. And so uh, one of our jobs um, in the governance committee for fossil free and decarbonization that Aaron and Sheila Antrim from UCSF co-lead is that we make sure we meet all five of these deliverables on a reasonable time schedule. So there's accountability built into the process. So the study will meet the first two deliverables, greenhouse gas mitigation. So basically our decarbonization, produce a strategy for 90% or greater reduction of scope one emissions. And that's gonna be from a 2009 baseline. 
And so um, we're excited about that. Everybody's committed to that and we're gonna make that happen. It's gonna take uh, money. And I think we all are aware of that and it'll be up to uh, us to creatively find that financing. And then number two that we can expect from the decarbonization study is high level estimates of what are the capital, what are the operational costs and what are the phases that we need to do our work in so that it can be effective and that we can um, complete things in as timely a manner as possible. So those two things are what we are evaluating with the current RFQ that is in now. And then three things are left for us to, to uh, work on. And uh, Aaron just went over number three about uh, climate justice. So we know what that is. And then number four is to uh, basically look at knowledge gaps and subsequent studies and analysis needed to get to net zero planning that address interim reduction target dates for scope one, two, and three. And so that is something that UCSF is uh, very much in favor of, and I'll talk about in a little bit. And then uh, the last one is basically, we are a research academic institution. So what can we do basically to conduct climate action and resiliency planning for an academic institution that involves our, our strengths in research, the strength of our learners or other activities on our campus? So here's the timeline. So like I said, we've uh, gotten past number one, um, a technical review panel consisting of those members is gonna start meeting, uh, like I said, next month, next week. And then we'll get a short list to our executive sponsors uh, by about May 6th. We'll interview the short list and then we'll, there'll be UC briefings and approvals, including from the academic Senate, including from the provost and ultimately from Chancellor Hoggood uh, as well. And, the CET. So we anticipate awarding to a, uh, one of the consultants in early June, negotiating their contract, and then their work will commence uh, immediately in July, and we expect them to complete all of their work product within a nine to 12 month period. I think uh, I saw some uh, activity in the chat a little bit earlier. So UC has proposed an updated policy. Um, and so for greenhouse gas emissions, the old policy is on the left. The policy that's proposed is on the right. You'll have access to all these slides later, so I won't read them, but it does, uh, we, UC is general, UCSF is generally in support of the updated policy, but with some extra comments. And I know that the letter that's going around is asking people to sign um, on to supporting those, those comments. So let me, let me go over a little bit of what we, uh, what we have heard so far. So this includes academic Senate review and feedback and happy to update this with more information um, as the group sees fit. So there's a consensus from UCSF on setting up separate breakout goals for each scope, one, two, and three, and keeping the 2019 base year. Um, there's a consensus from UCSF on setting interim targets. So not just having one major goal at the end, but what should there be some interim targets? There's a consensus at UCSF to recommend uh, sunsetting the use of biogas before 2040 and adding a policy, uh, adding to the policy a definition for carbon renewal. And then explicitly UCSF wants to see, UCSF wants to see including renewable hydrogen as an option. So those are, that's going on right now in the review and comment period. And UC is expected to be done with this process and the final policy by early 2024. So one thing we wanted you to know is that every University of California project above $5 million, which is a major capital project, um, requires lead certification and no on-site fossil fuels for space and water heating. So that's something we wanted to share with the group. And a lot of progress has been made towards that. And I wanna go over some of that progress. So NHPH, our new uh, hospital at Parnassus Heights, obviously we wanna build a robust all electric best in class hospital, and it'll further position UCSF as an innovative healthcare leader, not only in science, but in service. And big shout out to Bruce Mace and to Anna Levitt for their leadership in getting uh, the NHPH project um, on track for a robust all electric best in class hospital. Thank you. So I'm gonna highlight just a couple of things. So um, on that hospital that we were just talking about, um, rendering there, and just to highlight that energy efficiency in that hospital is expected to be two times better than currently exists in Moffat Long, uh, carbon neutral operations and embedded carbon reductions. So all electric heating, primary heating and cooling systems. So, um, Big shout out to the planning that's going on there for that group and uh, putting us in, uh, having a modern uh, hospital. Major projects, electric building projects that are opening. ZSFG scheduled to open here in 2023. 
and the Bayfront uh, Medical Building. I'll show a few details more about that. Um, excited this boy, this uh, project is on track for lead gold, currently tracking at 70 points. Um, and it's really exciting that the current design tracking and EIU and energy use intensity um, that is 12% below the UCOP benchmark compliance target with some solar thermal panels there providing heating for domestic hot water and heating hot water. And so also the, the garage is also uh, aiming for certification. Um, Park Smart Certification Silver, and it's the only certification system that defines measures and recognize high performing sustainable garages. So you'll see that happens with EV charging stations, more bike parking, ener energy efficient building systems, and low VOC materials. So congratulations on that project as well. The PRAB, um, exciting here as well, the EUI is target of less than 115, which is over two times better than any UCSF existing lab building. So exciting development there for this, this building, also all electric. And then uh, our staff is currently planning a project at the Mount Zion Cancer Research Center. There's some more information about it in the appendix, but basically we're looking to estimate to save over 50% of the existing building's uh, energy um, with significant GHG emission savings with a special project that is gonna be going on there to change to variable air volume. And uh, if you're interested in that, um, highly uh, just send us an email. We're happy to sit down and talk the details through with anyone that might be interested. So there's a lot of work going on there. Very proud of that work. And now happy to hand it over to my colleague, Amit, who's gonna talk about transportation. Amit. Thank you, John. And good afternoon, everyone. Over the next few minutes, I'll highlight our continued commitment to fossil fuel free and ongoing decarbonization efforts, specifically in the transportation area, which is typically a major source of scope three emissions. Uh, to gauge how we commute and to plan for future, we conduct an annual commute survey in the fall of every year. And what we see here is the 2022 survey results, as well as comparison with 2021. So as it shows on the right, the single occupancy vehicle rate, which we call SOV rate or solo driving, creeped up again in 2022. So in 25.5, it used to be 25.5 in 2021. And last year, it creeped up to 29.3, which is a concern. While the use of UCSF shuttles and public transit has increased, continued work from home and hybrid schedules, as well as concerns over personal safety and cleanliness of public transit have contributed to more solo driving. The UC goal is to have each campus achieve a 10% reduction in SOV rate by 2025 compared to the 2015 SOV rate, and we have already achieved that goal. Still, we'll continue to promote non-auto modes with a goal to bring down the SOV rate to the pre-COVID level, which was around 25%. Next, I'll share further details on uh, commute survey results. This map shows where we live within the nine Bay Area counties. 46% of us uh, are in San Francisco, and about 28% are in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. From a regional perspective, those living in Napa, Solano, Contra Costa, and Alameda counties are and working in San Francisco now face heavy traffic congestion along many freeways like 80, 24, and 580, as well as the Bay Bridge that are very close or above to pre-COVID congestion levels. So many of these commuters have already switched to public transit. On the other hand, due to continued work from home plus recent layoffs in the high-tech industry, traffic congestion along San Mateo and uh, Santa Clara County freeways is not at pre-COVID levels. And therefore, commuters from those areas continue to drive. Here we see a couple of charts. On the left is the breakdown of transit agencies for those UCSF commuters who take public transit. With nearly 75% of UCSF population living in the city and two East Bay counties, Muni and Bart have the largest share of the UCSF transit commuters. 
On the right, we see a breakdown of final arrival mode. So for example, I take part from East Bay and then ride our shuttles to one of the campuses. So I'm on the 32% group on the left and 17% group on the right. Next, we'll see some reasons why we choose to drive. <clears throat> Here the table at the top shows that how our SOV rates, rate has been creeping up post pandemic. Uh, although our SOV rate continues to be lowest among UC campuses, we are still concerned and we want to go back to our pre-COVID SOV rate. So as the bar, bar chart shows, 26% of UCSF commuters choose to drive because driving is the quickest. So it is likely that many of these drivers could switch to other modes when traffic congestion get worse. Another 31% drive because they need some flexibility or have some obligations before or after work. And we respect that not everyone can take public transit. So it's likely that many of these drivers will continue to drive until their personal situation changes. We're still committed to explore all strategies and solutions to encourage those who can switch to non-auto modes. Next, we are pleased to share that a student transit pass referendum placed on the ballot earlier this month has been voted in by the students. As a result, beginning fall 2023, all UCSF students will receive a highly discounted mini pass allowing them unlimited rides on all mini services seven days a week, except cable cars. So this monthly pass will cost 23 compared to a regular mini pass, which is at $81. We are exploring similar options for UCSF employees that will help us increase the use of public transit. In addition to transit, we are also increasing our efforts on the bicycling front. As mentioned earlier, UCSF developed the first bicycle and micro mobility plan last year. And now we are in the early stage of implementation phase. Not to forget, we have planned a series of events promoting bicycling during the month of May. Now changing the gears from commute behavior to our shuttle operations. We provide shuttle services from about 4.50 a.m. through 9.30 p.m. on weekdays. And we have a diverse fleet of about 60 vehicles. I'm glad to share that our commitment to fossil free fuels and shuttle operations is stronger than ever, and it shows in our actions. We have far exceeded the UC goal that requires 50% of vehicle purchase be either all electric or hybrid beginning July 23. In fact, our shuttle purchase over the last five years included 61% all electric vehicles. So not only that we exceeded the 50% goal, but we initiated this effort five years before the July 23 effective date of the 50% requirement. So currently about 30% of all of our transportation fleet is all electric. And our goal is to replace the remaining gasoline and diesel vehicles with all electric vehicles for the next five years. Of course, this ambitious plan will require an investment of about 12 million. And we have already allocated $1 million in the fiscal 24 budget, as SVC Gore mentioned. We recently submitted a $4 million grant and will continue to pursue other state and federal grant opportunities in the future as well. As we pursue these ambitious goals of decarbonization in commuting and our shuttle operations, we look forward to your continued support and feedback. I want to thank you all and I'll turn it back to Aaron. Thank you, Amit. And I'm going to turn it over to Myra so we can get ourselves back on uh, schedule. Thank you, Amit and Aaron and John. Uh, that was really informative. And I think, you know, it's, it's so great to see campus leadership um, you know, helping with the heavy lift. We can all do sort of small things on our own, um, but there's some things that we really need leadership to, to do for us. So that's terrific. All right. So I'm going to just spend a few minutes on a call to action. Uh, you know, I think we've all, you've heard that from everyone this afternoon, but things that individuals can do to really move us forward. 
So really, you know, we're asking you to consider the climate as sustainability implications in everything that you do. And efforts put in now in this crucial time to save energy and resources will save money for UCSF during this challenging post-pandemic time. You know, we just had the email from Suresh talking about budget. It will help delay reaching the cliff of climate destabilization and smooth the transition to a clean powered economy. So, you know, simple no brainer things, turn out the lights, turn off computers. Please, please, please join one of our working groups. Uh, Liz shared the information in the chat or you can go to the Academic Senate uh, Sustainability Committee webpage. Um, and then I would like to make an argument that those of us at UCSF with larger salaries should do more. There's plenty of literature that shows that people with more resources use far more than their share of the carbon budget, both individually and as, as a country. And so if you have the financial wherewithal, electrify at home, there are lots of federal and local rebates right now, um, so it's a good time to do it. Avoid buying a brand new gas vehicle. Um, you know, if you're going to buy a fancy new sports car, make an electric fancy new sports car. Uh, I ask people to avoid creating FOMO. You know, don't show trips to exotic locations on social media or humble brag about some international conference you're going to. If you're gonna post on social media or if you send holiday cards or letters, focus on people, not on travel or things. If you have a yard, plant trees, help sequester carbon, volunteer for Friends of the Urban Forest in San Francisco, plant a veggie garden. You can do this on a balcony or a windowsill. Avoid paving over your yard or otherwise increasing impermeable surfaces. You know, we, we saw a lot of flooding with the uh, atmospheric rivers this earlier this year. And if there are people downstream from you, um, they will appreciate not getting your rainwater into their uh, yards and basements. So let's think about what we can do as a community to take advantage of this time in history to make positive changes to benefit the health of people in our community around the world, around the globe. So I'd like to open us up to questions. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for doing such a terrific job of uh, explaining the activities that are going on campus and how important it is really to engage in this. And I'd like to give a special shout out to Liz Greenwood who organized us uh, and kept us on track. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. So I just mentioned in the chat, but if you have any questions you'd like to ask today's presenters, you can go ahead and put them in the Zoom Q&A, and I will try to direct them to the right person. We did have one question come through earlier in the Q&A that I wanted to start with, um, which was, will, um, let's see, for scope three emissions, I think some percent, maybe a quarter to a third, is related to the healthcare system's investments. And can anyone speak to efforts for UC to change investment strategies to reduce scope three emissions? Seema mentioned earlier that UC passed investment targets three years ago, and I just wanted to see if anybody wanted to elaborate on that answer. Well, I I'll I'll take sort of the first part of that. So. Um, because of efforts that came really from a grassroots level, both at UCSF and other campuses in the UC system, the investment funds, uh, the retirement investment funds for UC um, have been fossil free now for a few years. Um, and so the stocks, you know, if you just sign your retirement money into the target you know, 20, 40 or whatever age band you're in, you'll be getting fossil fuel free uh, investments. Um, as far as the money that UCSF itself has in the bank, I cannot speak to that, but perhaps Erin has something that you can clarify. So, so all of our money uh, goes through uh, the office of the president. So, so that, that would be for that. I don't have the UCSF Foundation uh, with me right now, but I will bring that to a future discussion. 
Um, I did have a sort of unofficial discussion with them a few years ago. And I think as, you know, I'm not sure that my fervent arguments necessarily swayed them as much as the fact that fossil fuels are really strand becoming stranded assets. Had it not yeah. been for the war in Ukraine, nobody would be investing in fossil fuels right now. So I think from a purely business sense, I think they've been getting out of fossil fuels. You are exactly correct. And there's a number of members of their board who are very active in and uh, advocates for the, the business upside that we would benefit from, from investing in renewable techno technologies, right? That is the technology of the future. So that, that is both true. I just don't know how many stranded assets they still have in the portfolio, but they have been moving this direction over the past number of years. Um. Hi, Maria and everybody. I just wanted to mention, um, you know, emissions from scope three um, supply chain is a is a big issue and focus now. And the health system is actually starting to look at this and will be reporting as part of the White House climate pledge, our scope three emissions. And then um, on the campus side, across the 10 campuses, we are starting to talk about that as well. Thank you, Graham. Great, so another question from the Q&A. The Inflation Reduction Act has a provision for clean energy. Is there an opportunity to attract federal funding to replace our cogen plant? So, so I'll take that first. So both at the system-wide level and we're looking at ways, I feel like I'm listening to every podcast about it uh, to try to access that. So that is a, a a focus uh, on many levels that we're trying to see what opportunity there could be. There's also some um, discussions and leveraging the power of having the, the fossil free be system wide, just because of the huge impact of that. And is there a way to kind of help the, the system wide goal as well, which would help us. Great. And a follow up question that I had is, are there specific lobbying directions that UCSF is working toward? Are there specific things you would recommend people do in terms of contacting federal or state elected officials? So, so that has been part of under all of this work at the system, kind of the communication plan. And so I'm hoping we will have something end of the summer. The, the thing is, do we wait until our plans because everyone, you know, as John mentioned, we're a little ahead. People haven't finished their study. So does it help us to be a little further along so we know how big the problem is? We're going to solve UC Berkeley, for example, benefited from some one-time money from the state because they were ready. Um, so just I think people are trying to think about how to harness the power of having us all uh, reach out. So, so more to come on that. Great. So... How did UCSF think of implementing renewable hydrogen as a means of energy production on campus? That is part of the study. That that that, that was explicitly discussed under the fossil free guidelines to make sure that it's an option. Um, but we need to have the study finished to see how how maybe we could use that. But I would add from the you know. Uh, medical professor point of view, you know, none of us are super excited about something that might turn out to have secondary harm. So, you know, certainly from my perspective, you know, unless there's some amazing new technology or something really, some really convincing argument for it, I would argue against it. So I, I appreciate you calling that out. I didn't want to say it's not without controversy, right? So so anyway, we got to look at all the options and, and what comes out and then have that very good, robust discussion. Yeah. Great. Erin, I want to go back to something you mentioned in your presentation. So I, I know that one of the ways to reduce carbon use is installing so the heat pumps on the PCAP so that we're, our heating is using less energy. But I'm also noting that that may continue our dependence on the PCAP if we're installing more um, heating on that. And so I'm just wondering how you think about the pros yeah. and cons of the uh, conservation around reducing carbon from heating, but also then we're still using the PCAP more and more. 
Well, so that is the exact conversation we had about mechanical that we could not, to have the, I'm going to totally oversimplify, but to have the highest environmental impact mechanical on the PRAB, there was not enough space. So for us to have it, and Anna Levitt's on, so she can she can correct this, I'll take a stab, and then she can jump in. We're putting it next to, and we are using the, the P-Cup now. There is a commitment to decommissioning and evolving the P-Cup, um, but that is, you know, a conversation we had. Uh, the, the skeptics say, you know, it just makes it harder for us to do that. At the same time, we have to make some choices to make sure that each building is up to the highest level. Anna, is there anything you would add to that or correct? Um yeah, sure. So I would say the peak up is just a name for yeah. the central <laughs> utilities plant, first of all. Um, so, you know, right now it is a cogeneration plant, but a heat pump system would generate heating with electricity and not with fossil fuels. Um, and so the, the goal would be to really transition away from the fossil fuels. So the heat pump dependent system would not be a fossil fuel system. Great. Um, what is the plan to retrofit the aging existing building systems that are inefficient and more carbon intensive than newer ones? And I don't know if you want to take this first. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yep, sure. It's, what is the plan to retrofit the aging existing building systems that are inefficient and more carbon intensive than newer ones? So basically, what are retrofitting plans for buildings that aren't being replaced? Yeah, absolutely. So Aaron, Aaron and John spoke to this a little bit, but one of the key things is, of course, making them more efficient. So Health has a $50 million plan to invest in existing facilities to make them operate more efficiently. And I know that campus has had a program for decades and ongoing to do that work as well. And then the new thing to align with our decarbonization is really transitioning away from steam dependence because there's really no efficient way to generate steam with electricity. Um, heat pumps generate heating hot water, not steam. And that's going to be the major, very challenging, somewhat disruptive investment in our existing facilities to move away from steam. And I know Ben Levy is on the line in case uh, you want to speak to anything on the campus specifically. Um, sure. Uh, Anne has said it very well, though, and we are and have been retrofitting buildings. Um, it's an ongoing thing. We have a pool of money of $20 million that we spend on retrofitting and we and we then the savings from, from retrofitting and making more energy efficient always goes back and um, pays for more of that energy efficiency. So we're doing that. Mount uh, John talked about Mount Zion that is saving half of the energy use and half of the GHG in that building um, just by virtue of doing that very thing. And, and I think the main thing is that we're expecting this study to specifically address because that's the bigger questions are the ones that the hard ones that's what we want to get from the study so we'll look forward to that result. Great um, another question what can members of campus do to accelerate decarbonization of our core infrastructure so a lot of the stuff we talked about are things that are happening at a very high level. And I'm, we're wondering if there's anything individuals can do to help. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we, we wanna publish something in the next several months to uh, allow for everybody to participate. That's one of our, one of our main goals is um, how do we get everyone involved in this? And so I think one of the ideas that we have is rolling out energy audits. So if you're running a lab, wouldn't it be cool if you could call this number and uh, a group said, you can, you know, here's our five recommendations for you to take your energy footprint from this lab down by 20% or 30% or even more. And that could be lighting. It could be st stuff to do with uh, air handling. It could be where your equipment is. So I think that that's one of the um, options we're looking at is having a team that could go out to a lab or an office or research or a clinic and uh, basically come up with a prescription for that, uh, that area to uh, follow so that they could actually, everybody's participating. 
Yeah, and I'd like to mention, you know, we've had this uh, office certification program, a laboratory certification and a clinic unit. And if we could partner with facilities to make that work more smoothly, so we're a full service assessment, and then you get certified, you get, you know, accolades for it. And we've been announcing that kind of um, success stories at our sustainability award ceremony. So it's certainly we can, um, now that we're post COVID and people are coming back to their offices and uh, labs and clinics, we can kick that, kickstart that off with a really robust program. And, and if I could add one thing, um, so one thing that you're gonna do um, hopefully in a, in a very um, responsive way is when we go into buildings and we do these major retrofits, they're very disruptive. We're gonna be moving people out of labs and taking care of fume hoods and taking care of, of exhaust um, hoods. And so it's it's extremely disruptive and we know that. Um, and, and we just depend on everybody's coordination and cooperation with, with um, helping us to make that happen in a very you know, re reasonable time frame. Great, so in a question from the Q&A, will the shuttle system be expanded geographically? I'll take that, I'll take that one. So we, regularly look at our ridership data pretty much on a daily basis, weekly basis, and a monthly basis. And then annually we tweak, we add frequency. Sometimes if we see more demand, that doesn't necessarily mean more buses, but we deploy our larger capacity buses. So we continually make sure that our ridership demands are met. In terms of adding new routes, yes, we'll be exploring those opportunities. Unfortunately, for about last year and a half, there was severe shortage of drivers and we couldn't expand our services. But now things are looking better and we look for opportunities to expand in the future. Great. How can we ensure that um, future EV shuttle purchases and configurations meet rider expectations for comfort so that riders prefer the electric vehicles? That's a great question. We are very mindful of our past decisions and some rider comfort on our existing EV fleet. I think sometimes when we do cutting edge or we are the first one, we take that risk, uh, but we learn the lessons. So what we plan is <clears throat> in coming months, we'll be looking at number, number of different models and manufacturers and we will encourage them to give us at least one unit to run for a few months and then get rider feed, the feedback first before we literally purchase the equipment. So that's how we're gonna proceed. Great, the question for many people, um, how can UCSF reduce structural inequities in our local community through our efforts to decarbonize? So I'll start with that. I think that's, uh, as we talk about some of our um, local efforts under the environmental justice, we want big uh, participation. So one of the items I have become familiar with, and I won't get the researcher's name correctly, so I will omit it. Uh, like we do a lot of asthma research uh, in Oakland, right? And so that's a great thing that we are already doing in the community, which is I will say, you know, a caught, you know, the output of of our use of of fossil fuel. So, you know, where can we think about those type of work that has been underway that is doing? Is there additional support? So, I think there's probably lots of ideas uh, from our research centers on campus as well as the community. And so that's where we really want to partner with all of you and others to make sure we have the best thinking. As, as we look to, to what we do uh, with some of that focus on the um, environmental justice component. Great, does anyone else wanna weigh in? I would just echo Aaron's sentiment that that is crucially important. You know, we know that the harms thus far from climate change have really fallen on uh, communities of color and poor communities. 
And even though there's research saying that decarbonization and electrification of building and vehicles will benefit um, you know, poor communities in the Central Valley uh, disproportionately, I mean, in a good way. Um, so there is, we know that there are health benefits to decarbonizing. We don't want to create further sort of structural problems in our local community. So we definitely need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, and uh, also I can add, the health system is looking at climate resilience. Um, so we will be doing some community outreach to get feedback from the communities um, in our area, San Francisco, um, to find out what their needs could be and, and how we can help address those. Great. Well, and we're coming to the end of the hour. So if there aren't any more questions, I really want to give my heartfelt thanks to all of our panelists and everybody who came to listen today. You know, this is such an important thing, and we really appreciate all the efforts that people are making, big and small, to move forward. Again, we'd love to have your help, so please feel free to contact any of us to get involved. Uh, the QR code here is for the Gales uh, office, the sustainability office, and we will also be sharing the video and other resources from today's session on our sustainability website. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Mm.